Welcome to Your Mental Breakdown, the podcast where you get to follow along with the client in real therapy sessions. And you'll hear two licensed psychotherapists. That's us. Breaking it down afterwards. So you get a look behind the curtain. In this episode, you guys will hear Doug analyze Drew's dreams, even though he claims he doesn't analyze dreams. In the session, Drew walks us through the nightmare that he had and some of the anxiety coming up around his girlfriend. In the breakdown, we talk about being present in the moment and how symbolism can help us process our thoughts and feelings. Stick around. Welcome. I am Doug Friedman. And I'm Meredith Levy. And this is your Mental Breakdown. How are you? I'm good. How are you doing? I am doing well, thank you. Now that you have your, your foot carpet? <laughs> yeah, Beckett. Yeah. I'm good cutting for... with my foot. That's right. He likes it. He, he uh, <laughs> this is not a compelling story, but he made a coyote lose his shit the other day. I, I mean, when I say it like that, it's kind of cool, but there was a coyote in the backyard and he ran after it and it tried to get out <gasps> through the side gate, but had trouble because it couldn't squeeze through right away. Oh. Uh, Oh, for the coyote? Yeah. Fuck that thing. Why? Because they're wild and I don't know. I mean, you realize that we took over their land, right? (laughs) People get so upset when it like eats a cat. I'm like, well, you know, we did take over their land. They have no more food. Sorry. That's true. Okay. So an indigenous dog-like creature was in my backyard. (laughs) Um, Beckett chased it through the side gate when it was having trouble getting out. It finally did squeeze out, but then I looked over where it was and there was just a big pile of shit right there oh so it, it literally lost the shit literally yeah. oh my yeah <laughs> oh beckett you a badass that's right don't mess with him what if it had turned and gotten its whole pack and came back uh i don't know what if it had a wounded leg and i had to take it inside and heal it and it became my new best friend oh that See? would have been cute too playing the what if game i know we which do- so much of that's <laughs> up and coming isn't right? it yes. right right Real life. It's what we do. It is. Well, should we jump into some stuff? Sure. Yeah, we had a lot of uh, fun and great emails and questions following up the last uh, episode. Yeah. Keep them coming. Yourmentalbreakdown.com. I swear I'll get better about looking at them. Sure you will. (laughs) Sure you will. Obsessively, probably. Probably, Yeah. yeah. One of the... Funniest ones, which actually had come up a couple times, Hmm. was a comment slash question slash whatever (laughs) about um, why were there guy strippers at all? Oh, at the, yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, Just, yeah, I just thought, wow, that's a really minuscule subject matter to focus on. And yet (laughs) I get it. I do. No offense to all the male strippers out there listening to or our- those that really like male strippers. Sure. You guys too. Sure. The next thing there was a lot of comments on was the Yoda Darth Vader. Of course, that was to be oh, expected. Yeah. Sure. Not only just how great it was, but how people felt like they could incorporate it into their own lives hmm. and how not just the goal of wanting to be Yoda- which we all want to be Yoda, sure. not just think like him and sound like him, but also look like him. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's weird. Cause is he like the wise old wizard man, like a Gandalf type thing, or is he, you know, like the cute little Ewok or the gremlin before they go bad? I mean, it's hard to say, like, That's is a he great question cute or is he old and wise? I mean, I think he's, a I little think bit those are not mutually exclusive. Right. He's right? cute, old and wise. Right. Yeah. Well, I, I think the idea And why I love using Vader and Yoda so much is we walk around with more Vader in our heads than anything else. And the idea isn't replace Vader with Yoda so Vader doesn't exist. Because Vader can motivate us if we use it correctly. And if you think about it, Vader and Yoda both use the force. They come from the same place. Mm -hmm. So it's really about balance. It's about having the two together and finding that balance for yourself. You know, that's why you might hear this in one of our bonus clips, but having a, an angel and a devil right there with you in your ear. Yep. The light and the dark. That's right. Yep. Yep. No spoilers. No spoilers here. And then the last thing that 
I saw a lot of was people commenting about how, you know, we, you guys talked about jealousy in the episode. And Hmm. I think just touching on that, even so many people related to it and basically everyone wanted to know how they can stop being jealous. So can you just tell everyone that? Sure. Okay. Okay. In order to stop being jealous. (laughs) Okay. So the real truth, how can you not feel jealous? You can't. It's a feeling. You're going to feel it. What defines you is what you do when you do feel jealous. How you can recognize it for yourself and see, am I jealous of this one thing this one time? Is it localized in that sense? And then can I communicate that to my partner, whoever I'm jealous of? If it's larger than that, not just localized, but feels globalized, like, oh my gosh, this feels like anybody who's ever had anything more than me and I'm less than and it's triggering all this huge jealousy. That's something you need to process because it's stuff you've been holding on to. And I, I was actually talking to a client and she was saying how we were talking about how she was in a really sort of toxic relationship and how he was very jealous and possessive. And then, you know, talking about how she was dating this guy who wasn't like that at all. And she hated it, that he wasn't Mm. jealous. Mm. And he said, well, I'm never going to be that guy. And she was like, well, that's a problem. And how she wanted some jealousy. Yeah. And she said, I would rather be with the other guy who was like super jealous and possessive because at least it showed that he cared. Exactly. And I was like, meh. Well, I mean, both are true. That's the heart of it. Yeah. Showing that he cared. I think that's looking at when jealousy comes up, what does it mean? Right. It means I don't feel like somebody cares about me. Right. You know? So it's it's getting to the root of it. Right. Like if you're sitting there and some dude comes over and starts flirting with you and you're boyfriend's over there not giving a fuck like why doesn't he care what does that mean and him not caring you know why we can't read other people's minds Mm -hmm. accurately because we don't know if him not caring means oh sure she can talk to that other guy because i know she's with me i I have no problem with that and i trust her implicitly and that's wonderful and i'm so glad right and yeah, seeing her be flirty and smile, that's awesome. But if I see it and I don't like it for a second, yeah, I'll I'll come in and shut it down. Exactly. Or if the guy's being inappropriate or, you know, whatever that is. Right. And I've heard that before with couples I've worked with where one of them wants the other to be jealous. In fact, one guy said to the girl he was going out with at the time, I think they're actually engaged now. No, they're actually married now. And now um, they're divorced. <laughs> <laughs> not yet. Not yet. They will be. Good. They stopped coming, so they will be. <laughs> Um, no, not at all. I hope, um, she had some guy that she was sort of on and off with contact her. And he said, look, I really don't like that. I don't want to be possessive. I don't want to be that jealous guy, but I would really like you not to have contact with guy. I mean, what's the point? You're not going to be friends with him. You're not going to hook up with him. Right. And she said she loved that. Yeah. Like it, 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 because he said it that way. The way he said it. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. It wasn't trying to control her. And like Drew was saying, I, I don't want to control her. I would never want to do that. You know, and he's, he said several times when talking about her, she's never done me dirty. Right. 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 So it's, he wants that level of trust and that, that mutual love and respect and, and caring. And some people say it's, Unconditional love. And I go, no, it, it is conditional. There are conditions in a relationship. Of course. Absolutely. Of course. Right? Yeah. I yeah. wholeheartedly agree. Cool. Well, let's uh, hear what Drew has to say this week. We will indeed. And so, you know, here we go with Drew. We can tell you if you haven't been listening thus far, Drew is mid 20s, working on things like his relationship, trying to move out on his own and do his own kind of work. He has been estranged from brother for over a decade. And more recently, his brother invited him to the bachelor party uh, of his wedding that's coming up in a few months. And he's kind of dealing with how he feels about that. Let's see what comes up. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, what he said. (laughs) I had a crazy dream this weekend. Yeah. I had a crazy fucking dream this weekend. Like, this is the first time, like, I've woke up and, like... Let, hold on. Let me explain it, and then I'll tell you what happened. Because I, I legit woke up at, like, 2 a.m. Saturday night and, like, wrote it down hmm. because I was like, this... This was wild. So I was sleeping at my girlfriend's house. In my dream, I was dreaming of a dream. And then I woke hmm. up out of that dream in my current dream. 
panicking. And I was like, what's going on? And, and like kind of all those like red flags of like what I feel when I wake up out of a dream mm-hmm. was in my dream. And then were you aware that you're like, was it a lucid dream and you yeah. were aware of it and you were there? Yeah. 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 But it was, it was a weird, I knew I was dreaming cause it wasn't like, I woke up out of a dream and I thought I was awake, but then I realized I was still dreaming. I was talking to a girlfriend. I don't look at a balcony and she was like, yeah, I'm going to prom. And I'm like, you're 25, 26. Why are you going to prom? Like, what? I don't get it. And then she, her response to that was, oh, you don't, you don't know who this is? Like, look at him. Like, oh, so dope. Like, I'm just going because of, like, who he is, mm-hmm. which kind of ties back into the fact that she hangs out with certain people. Right. And I was like, you're 26, white prom. And then she started, like, kind of using it to, like, poke at me in my dream. I walked down these steps, and then I started running, like, as fast as I possibly could. And I remember that, like, super vividly. And mm-hmm. then I found myself on, like, a grass... Like a, like a yard but there was a lake out there pause for a second i just watched this show like it shows a scene where like he basically walks into the ocean because he's trying to kill himself mm-hmm. and so he like walks into the ocean as far as he can just starts swimming and then like, he gets saved by the guy in the show but that i think that's where my mindset and my dream was mm-hmm. was i was running 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 towards this lake and i had that feeling of just jump in and start swimming just go and so I'm running, 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 and then there's a dock, and I can't get to the end of the dock. It just keeps going. You know, mm. like I can see the end, but yeah. I can't get there. Yep. And, so and you're running the whole time. Right, as fast as I can. Yeah. And then I finally got to the end of the dock, and, and like, I felt it in my, I literally felt it in my dream, but I also felt it when I woke up, mm-hmm. of, like, this startled, like, because <gasps> there was a homeless guy at the end of the, end of the dock, and he like got up and I tried to talk in my dream and I was like, oh, I, I couldn't talk. Right. And then I realized that guy was me mm. and I was like, what? And then that's kind of like where I woke up. And then when I woke up, I was like out of breath, like, like panting. Cause I felt like I had been running and I was like exhausted. And I was sweating. Mm. And I literally woke up like, <sighs> like hands in my face type of thing. And like, I didn't, I I woke up and I was like, okay, I'm okay. I'm okay. Like, everything's fine. Like, I'm, I'm safe. Like, I'm good. Mm-hmm. Couldn't go back to sleep. So I was like, okay, let me, I'm just going to go out on the couch and watch TV, whatever. And so I basically stayed up from two until, like, huh. the next night because, like, I, I couldn't go back to sleep. Freaked out? Freaked out. Why? I don't, that's, I don't know. How do you make sense of the dream? I think first and foremost, I was freaking out about girlfriend. But waking up, like, I don't think that was the root of the problem. Freaking out in what way? Going to prom with some dude. You know, I, I think I struggle with that. Again, I don't know why I struggle with that. And that was in the dream. Yeah. Yeah, that was in the dream. So whatever the first dream was, that inception layer dream, yeah, right? Yeah. It was startling and put you in a state of night terror, t- you know, panic, like not okay or whatever mm-hmm. it was. Mm-hmm. And you woke up in that state in your dream, yeah. not knowing you were still dreaming. Right. So that's sort of you know, where it starts is yeah. I just woke up from this thing and I'm freaked out. And then everything that you described happens mm-hmm. to you, yeah. right? And you said you, you were carrying that what she was doing is not okay. Yeah. Like, why why is she doing this? Yeah, I just couldn't understand it. Right. Why? Like, tell, tell me why. And then, like, she, she was, like, antagonizing me to a certain extent. I mean, you said she was poking at you. Yeah. It, what was that? It was... What was the sensation for you? It was like a built up anger, you know, like on my end where I didn't understand why would you go to prom famous or not? I don't care who the guy is. Like, why? Like, what's the, what's the point of that? You know, mm-hmm. what is that saying to me? Like, what, why? And, and she like her response in the dream was, well, he's famous. He's got this. He's got that. Listing off things. And I think that was the antagonizing thing. Because I almost didn't feel up to par with that. Oh, I'm not good enough. If I was, you wouldn't be going to prom with this guy. Yeah. That's when I just said, fuck it. I just started running. Like, I'm out. And, and like, it's really, like, this is the first time where, like, something like that's really, like, affected me for, like, more than, like, two, three hours after the fact. Hmm. Like, I, I woke up yesterday 
kind of in the same mindset. Like I, I just I couldn't snap back from this one for whatever reason. The running part, were you running away from or were you running towards? I, I was running out of the house, through the lawn, okay. down the dock. Right. And sort of what was in your unconscious a little bit was that show where the guy went out there to kill himself. Mm -hmm. And that's where, you know, you said sometimes it's suicidal ideation in in Mm -hmm. the dreams, right? Yeah. And that idea that you weren't just running away from the house and the situation, but you were running towards, I don't know if it was the suicide or just ending this or, you know, in the dream, Mm -hmm. of course, right? But you couldn't get there. Right. You couldn't do it. You you know, the dock kept getting longer and bigger. And then you kind of get to the end of the dock and you're already there mm-hmm. as a homeless man. Mm-hmm. Right? Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of interpretation we can draw from this. Right. And it's not like, well, dream analysis. Does this. <laughs> yeah. It's how we make sense of this and, yeah. and what kind of fits. It's almost like horoscopes in a way. Mm-hmm. I mean, the, the dreams are the subconscious playground. It's right. where that mind gets to kind of come out and play around Mm -hmm. and throw these things at you to see how we make sense of them. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. I think above anything else, actually waking up at Mm 2am and with what just happened, it's really freaky. Mm -hmm. Did she wake up also? No. Okay. No, I slid out. Cause you didn't want to disturb her. Right. I wouldn't, I wouldn't even know what to say. You know, if I woke up, if I woke her up, Mm. Like, having that conversation, I would just be like, yo, I'm freaking out. I don't know what happened. I had this crazy dream. That's enough. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Mm-hmm. It's being able to explain and verbalize what your experience is at that moment. Mm-hmm. You don't have to make sense of it. You don't have to know what it is. Mm-hmm. You know what you're feeling. Yeah. And you say that, and she can provide some comfort for you there. Yeah. She's not going to make the dream all better. She's not going to make it make sense figure it out for you, but she can put her arms around you. Mm -hmm. You know, she can make you some milk and cookies, (laughs) whatever it might be. Right. And it's just being there for you. Yeah. I get that two o'clock in the morning, you don't want to wake her up. You don't want to wake her up with you freaked out. Mm -hmm. So it's okay. But the idea of, I don't know what to say. We just said it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cause we had that conversation last week too. Cause like, Okay, this is. I think this all ties in together now. I had to do a photo shoot, which I'm super uncomfortable with because, like, I don't want to be a model. I don't want to be in front of everybody. So I had to shoot some stuff online. And in the studio, there's all these models, all these people that are used to it all day. Right. And it's not like they were like making fun of me in any sense, but like clearly that's not what I'm meant to do. Like clearly, it's not like it's not what I'm for. <laughs> um, and so I walked out of that. Kind of like, uh, I hated that I just did that. And then I looked down at my phone and her friend group texted us out of, out of the blue and basically sent a picture of this dude. He's a famous dude. She was like, yo, I found your twin. And it was this goofy ass picture of him and like not cool at all. And so I kind of flipped the script and I was like, yo, fuck that. Fuck you. I'm over this. Like, stop. Like, over it. I got this huge fight. And then that kind of led to, I was going to go see her that night. And then she was like, maybe you should just stay home tonight. And I was like, okay. And then we got on a phone call. We talked for a little bit. And then fast forward, um, going into the weekend, she left yesterday for France for a week. So like kind of like the the ups and downs of this last week have been like super high and super low. The extremes we were talking about. Yeah. Not that, Mm -hmm. not that balance in the middle. Was there a resolve to it when you guys talked on the phone later? Yeah. Yeah. I think um, she felt super guilty because she knows where I'm at and like she knows like like triggers and stuff that are Mm -hmm. happening. I'm starting to figure that out and like what that looks like. Yeah. So she felt super guilty and like she cried for like an hour and was like, I'm so sorry. And then we talked about like taking time off because maybe I need to go get myself right before we get together and do this if if it's gonna be this serious then like maybe i just need to go and and handle this shit because she said that i don't know how to support you i don't know what you need i have no idea what that looks like i'm like i don't know what that looks like either i have no idea and so it's like and i don't want to hurt her through this process what's this process i think this process is me doing my shit finally you know and like i think 
I think now more than ever, like shit's coming up that I haven't even thought about in a really long time. Yeah. And so it's like bringing up all these past emotions. And, and I think we talked about it last week or the week before where it's like, it's not the actual event that I'm upset about. It's everything I've carried along with everything. Right. That's right. happening. Yeah. You know, like I don't care if she sends me a picture. Like, I, I don't give a shit. But it, it's everything that came out of that and with it that super upset me. And I think fast forward into my dream, I think my biggest struggle right now with her is me feeling like I'm not good enough. And, and I think, I don't know why, you know, because like at the end of the day, like I'm super honest with myself and like I know what I got and like, I know what I have to offer and like I'm, I'm cool with that, you know, and, right. and I'm very comfortable with that. But I can't get the other side out of my head where it's, it's the what ifs, you know, it's the what if game that I play with myself constantly. Yep. Totally. Yeah. And again, playing the what if game, got to play by the rules, right? which balance it out. What if she would be a support for you? Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. And what if part of these things coming up is a way to actually deal with them now? And it's a gift, Mm -hmm. not a curse. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. And that idea of, I think you nailed it, not being good enough. I mean, that's, that's a core belief embedded in there. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. And it's not true, but it, it, it's in there. It's in the brain from a very early age. It's, it's that, that earth is flat, earth is round. Like mm-hmm. whatever you grew up believing, you're going to find things that fit in there. Yeah. And that accumulation, like you said, of the things from the past that you carry around so much. Mm-hmm. And I can, I mean, just in what you told me now in the last 10 minutes, like, all right, I'm in a photo shoot with a bunch of models. Mm-hmm. I'm not good enough because they're professional. Right. I'm not good enough because right. I'm not, you know, the pristine supermodel prom guy right. you know right and in my dream girlfriend going to prom with some guy i mean there's nothing more uh, impactful than a high school prom because mm-hmm. in high school there's nothing bigger than that right right mm-hmm. and somebody dissing you for some other guy like yeah that's a rejection that's a you're definitely not good enough right it's around you a lot and pretty amazing i think that you're running from that Mm -hmm. because I think part of your integrity knows that that's not true, but it's also, you know, you're trying to create something, you know, making money, making, you know, Mm -hmm. fashion, making design, doing this stuff and hanging with the people that you hang with, but wanting to reject all of that and run from that because it's not leading you to a place of being good enough Mm -hmm. and running from it to, in a sense, destroy yourself or destroy that that part of yourself. Mm-hmm. And then you get to see a version of you that's got nothing. Mm-hmm. That's that homeless guy at the dock. And we're in the same place. Yeah. That's, that's crazy. Yeah. I would ask that dream guy, <laughs> essentially you, mm-hmm. but I'd kind of go, all right, where's your solid ground? Where's your footing? Almost like what would happen if that guy in the dream Mm -hmm. who just woke up from a dream Mm -hmm. and is freaked out, what if he just stops running, just pauses for a minute? Mm -hmm. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know what happened because your, your nature as you've described it is I'm go, go, go. I'm always doing, I'm always doing, but we're trying to find that speed where maybe you aren't, Mm -hmm. you know, And, and maybe it really is a matter of what's underneath that counts because who you are, how you described your tattoos when we were talking about it, mm-hmm. the depth that you have, mm-hmm. that's you, man. Yeah. Like the way I'm interpreting all of that, it's like if I would have just stopped and looked, I would have realized where I was at because in my dream, it was a beautiful house. It was a beautiful location, an amazing lake. Like I was so focused on this one and this one that I didn't stop and realize where I was at. And I, and I think to take that a step further, I do that every day where it's like, mm. I'm so go, go, go that I don't have the time to sit and really realize like, this is what I'm doing. This is like, I'm literally living out my dream right now. Yeah. But I don't get it to enjoy it. Yeah. And so it's like, I need to take that step back and I, or slow down, walk a little bit and really look at what's going on. You Stop know? and smell the roses, baby. Yeah. I mean, really, yeah. it's we're so busy trying to get somewhere in life, we forgot to actually be here in life. Yeah. 
you know? Yeah. And I think you're right. That that's that's totally it. Oh, what if I just can be? Yeah. And I think that's what I'm trying to get. Yeah. You know, I, I need I want to get to the point where it's like I'm still moving forward, but I am enjoying every piece of it. Yeah. I think a couple of weeks ago we talked about like a five year, ten year plan, and it's like I think I'm so focused on what the end goal is right now mm-hmm. that I'm not even looking at what's going on in that process yep. or, or that path. And I I honestly think that's where like a lot of my like you know, my issues come from a different thing. But I think like right now what I'm struggling with is like I just need to slow down. It's it's all the cliches about it's the journey, not the destination that we talk about, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, that's kind of what you're hitting. And then even that idea, and this is this is almost the stopping the run. This is where I am. Yeah. And this is okay. Yeah. You know, it, it's like you said to me, because I said to you, <laughs> going, is it the thing or is it the anxiety about the thing? You know, the thing itself is okay. Like, this is okay. Yeah. I am okay. Mm-hmm. Right? Yeah. I think I'm feeling the same thing with, like, my brother. I was like, yo, Pops, like, I'm, like, not doing very good. Like, I don't really know. Like, I'm stressed out. I'm just not. I'm not at 100% right now. And he would, he texted me back. He was like, yo, like, let's just not go. Like, don't don't worry about it. It's going to be just fine. But that didn't, it didn't make me feel any, like, it didn't make me feel bad. It didn't make me feel good. I just kind of, like, eh. Like, in the middle somewhere. Like, it, it didn't, it didn't give me an out. It didn't make me feel comfortable. Yeah. If we look at your purpose for going, it's not necessarily to have a blast, right? right? It might be to start forging a relationship with my brother. That can happen without going. That's possible. Yeah. I don't think I would, though. I don't either. <laughs> you know, I'm just I'm highlighting that yeah. as, as it's a choice. Yeah. But there's there's something, too, about a way to look at... Maybe the bachelor party as a precursor to the wedding, as a step in that direction, as part of the journey, not the destination, right? A lot of times what a bachelor party is or events like that is, is a way for people to get to know each other so they're more comfortable at the actual wedding, Mm -hmm. right? Yeah. It gives you a way to bond with them Mm -hmm. that will then make the wedding a little less unknown, Mm -hmm. So you can be more comfortable going into the wedding, even though your dad's absolutely going to be at the wedding mm-hmm. and you'll have more people there. You'll see some some guys that you were with in Texas. I guess I'm getting everything I've asked for, mm-hmm. but I still don't feel like I want to go. I think my my fear of going now is if it goes bad, what's the wedding going to look like? What would it going bad mean? Being isolated, you know, being the one guy in the corner when everybody else is having fun, being friends, knowing each other, and I'm the one guy there that's like, I don't know you guys. Yeah. You know, and if I'm isolated there, I'm going to be isolated at the wedding. Well, hold on. That's a leap. Yeah. yeah fair. And that's a what fair. if, right? Yeah, it is. Right? So let's, let's. I mean, we got a double what if that. Yeah. Right? <laughs> There's the first what if of... What if I'm isolated at the bachelor party? Yeah. What if they're all over there and I'm over here? Yeah. So let's balance that out. Give me another what if. Yeah. What if I'm fully included and it goes really good? Yeah. Yeah. The other what if is what if it goes badly? Then the wedding, the what if is it's just an extension of that. It's even worse. Right. Okay. So balance that one out. What if the bachelor goes really good and then I'm really involved in the wedding? And like the the other thing with all of that is this will be the wedding will be the first time that I bring girlfriend to like a family function. But that so far is going to be the first time that I basically present her to my family. And so it's like I feel like going to the bachelor party now is laying the groundwork for that as well. Oh, I just caught a piece of that in in the look of terror in your eyes as you said that yeah and it might be a little bit of so if the bachelor party is laying the groundwork for bringing girlfriend to meet my whole family what if that doesn't go well right and then throw that into the dream of everything what if she doesn't like my family you know and like what if yeah i'm not good enough and what if she sees that yeah side of everything yeah 
hell of a lot of what ifs. Right. Let's balance it out real quick. Yeah. What if I go to the bachelor party and I talk to my brother about girlfriend and like how dope she is and like all that shit. And that leads to a bigger conversation of like, oh, they're talking, we're having fun, we're doing our thing. Mm -hmm. And then fast forward to the wedding and he already knows about her. So then he's super stoked because he's heard all this dope stuff about her. Yeah. And he wants to meet her. Yeah. Nice. And that's that feels a lot better. Yeah. But I still struggle with the other side of things. You know, I, I still like that. I think this the bad side of things is is a true feeling of like certainty, while the good is a positive in my mind. Like, oh yeah, that could happen. Yeah, and look, I, I've told you this is the only time I ever engage in positive thinking. Right. I'm not a positive thinker. I'm an accurate thinker. Yeah. So the accurate thinker in me, yeah. Mr. Accurate, not Mr. Positive, is going to say, oh. So those negative things that you're taking as truth, Mm -hmm. bullshit. Yeah. They're not truth. Yeah. We're so used to catastrophizing and things going wrong and things going bad and Mm -hmm. feeling awful when they do Mm -hmm. that we guard against that feeling. Yeah. Yeah. We guard against, I can't tolerate this. I can't handle this. This doesn't feel good. Mm -hmm. You've had probably the worst experience of it at a young age. Mm -hmm. And then repeatedly. Right. So catastrophizing to you is like, yeah, but that shit can happen. Right. Doesn't mean it's going to keep happening. Doesn't mean it's true. Mm-hmm. And certainly doesn't mean we have to live in fear of it all the time. Mm-hmm. You know that? I mean, that's the PTSD, man. Right. It's there's that constant fear that this can happen again, that this is going to happen. And we put ourselves in this heightened state of alert mm-hmm. and we stay locked in that that fight or flight mechanism, that that state of alert all the time. And it's horrible. Yeah. I mean, I would argue that you have a night terrorist. Eh, nah, I would say you just have terror all the time. I, th- I think diving into constant terror and like why is something that's always been in the back of my head and like something I've always like known. Yeah. Just something I've never kind of like, like death, you know, I kind of did that you know, with that to where it's like, I always know it's there, but I don't know. I don't always deal with it. Cause I think that's one, why I work so much. Cause then I don't have to deal with it. And then two, that's also why I smoke before I go to sleep. Cause when I smoke before I go to sleep and I get pretty stoned, I don't dream. And so it's like, when I don't dream, I'm cool. Like I'm, I'm straight. I wake up, good I'm mood. Safe. I'm ready to go. Yeah. You know, as soon as like, and, and like, that's looking back at it. I think that's kind of why, this past week and I had that dream because like, I wasn't smoking. I was just kind of, I was tired. I was going to sleep. And that's when it was super vivid and real and like all that shit happened. And like, yeah, that's, I couldn't do anything about it. I couldn't go out and smoke. I couldn't do it. Like I, I just had to sit there in it, mm-hmm. um, which I think was the most terrifying thing. And just one more thing, like while I'm thinking about it, I think the reason I'm so afraid to the girlfriend what's going on like in the moment of it happening it's because every time i've done that they always leave they, they always i can't handle this i can't i don't know how to help you i can't do this and so like my fear is like as soon as i do open up in that way that is just gonna be too much for me and i you know i don't it might not be you know it could be a great thing and she could help me but but every time up until right now it's been no nah, i can't do that is there anything different about your environment right now than previous times you've been in relationships and said this? I think I'm a lot, I know that's weird to say right now, but I'm a lot healthier mentally right Outside. now because I'm aware. You know, I'm aware with where I'm at. I don't necessarily know, like, to my blackout phase, mm-hmm. like, when it's happening, I don't know what to do there. But, I like, I told her the next day afterward when it, what had happened, mm-hmm. that, hey, I don't fucked up night. This is what happened. This is what I dreamed of here's how I was feeling, all that. Mm-hmm. And that was a lot easier to do because like, I got through it, done, cool. I can tell you now what's going on. I'll double down on that a little bit. Yeah. You are in a healthier mental state now. You're also taking care of your mental state now by talking to me. Mm-hmm. You're bringing these issues out and not compartmentalizing them and tucking them away. Right. 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 And... You're actively working on this, mm-hmm. right? right? So you're not looking to your partner to fix it right. or to make it better. Mm-hmm. You're trying to make it better through talking to me and what we're doing. You're, you're 
working on fixing it, mm-hmm. what you're asking for from her is different. Right. And that's what I said to her too. You know, I was mm-hmm. like, I don't need you to fix this. You are never going to be able to fix this. This is not your problem. All I need from you is to tell me that you love me, give me a big hug, and that's it. You know, yeah. but on, on her end, like the, the conversation that we had, she was like, well, I need to be able to do more. Like, there has to be something like I we can talk about it. You need to tell me what's going on. All that kind of stuff. I was like, no, nah, like that's not your job. Your job is just to be there in a safe spot for me to where I know I'm OK. And that's all I need from you. I just need you to tell me I'm OK, yeah. that I'm loved and that yeah. that's it. Like That's all I need from you. That's really, I think, wise and insightful of you. Yeah. To recognize that, to be able to say that. Mm-hmm. That's great. Yeah. You it know? felt good. Because like, that's exactly what I need. Yeah. I, I mean, asking for what you need is fantastic, right? Yeah. All of that sounds great. I mean, yeah. I'm sorry you had <laughs> yeah. a bad night. It's okay. For sure. Yeah. No, it's not. Yeah. It's not okay. It happens. It happens, yeah. And it sucks. Mm-hmm. And you will survive. Mm-hmm. And you'll be okay. Yeah. But it's not okay. It sucks. Yeah. We don't like it. Right. You're aware of it and you're doing something about it. We're talking about it. Mm -hmm. You're right. Your mental health is different. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, even the last two months, you know, I I feel like it's leaps and bounds. Wow. I mean, even the way you're talking about the bachelor party and the wedding, like it's still, you know, still doing some what ifs, Mm -hmm. still having that, yeah, uncomfortable feeling, still seeing the layers there. But it's something that you might not be psyched to go to Texas and be like, yes, this is going to be awesome. But yeah maybe you can go, all right, well, this is part of the journey. Let's see how this goes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I feel like that's part of my either zero or a hundred. I feel like that's a really happy 50, hmm. you know, cause like going into it, I know I'm not going to necessarily enjoy it. You don't know that, but I could enjoy it. There you go. You know, so <laughs> that, that's that 50 where it's yeah. like, ah, it's a gray area. Let's see what happens. Right. Oh yeah. I see. What you're, I'm not going in psyched. Like, right. Oh, this is going to be awesome. But I'm also not going in. Oh, this is going to suck. I'm going in, well, it could suck. Could be great. Yeah. Don't know. Yeah. Let me be in that 50 and see which way it skews. Yeah. And maybe if some of it like starts to suck. Yeah. Okay. That's 40. Right. Not zero. Right. I'd rather be at 10 than zero. Yeah. At least that's a start. And there's room to work there. Yeah. Yeah. Hell yeah. That's cool, man. Hell yeah. We're, we're getting there, man. Hell yeah. We are. Well, hello. Welcome back. What'd you think? Well, as usual, I thought it was phenomenal. (laughs) No, I thought it was total shit, actually. Thank you. Nice. You know, it's funny. Listening to other sessions, which we haven't done in school, was all about critiquing and getting better and hearing that and doing that. I listen to these sessions and sometimes I go, oh, man, why did I choose that one? I should have gone there. Oh, wait, I did later. Or like oh, I went to that. I missed this. And let me bring that up later. For someone who doesn't analyze dreams, you right. fucking killed it. You're like, this is an analysis, like dream analysis. It's just an interpretation, maybe? an interpretation of it. And I was like, well, you certainly interpreted the fuck out of it. <laughs> well, it's, it's also, I look at therapy sometimes as we're inside somebody's head, right? Mm-hmm. So me and Drew are in the playground. Drew of his and head. I. Uh, no, no, you weren't there. <laughs> uh, You're yes. so damn witty, Doug. Drew, uh, thanks. And grammatically incorrect, apparently. Sometimes. So Drew and I are basically in his head, mm-hmm. you know, kind of sorting through a bunch of stuff. And why dreams to me are so fun to look at is that's another version of in your head. It's in your unconscious. So cool. We get to kind of play around in that now and make sense of it from this place that we're in, which is sort of what we were trying to do. But yeah. I'm really just trying to follow his lead. There are certain things that I can tell like, wow, that really seems to represent this thing that we've been talking about or work on. And even if that's not what it actually meant, it makes sense and we can make it work. Right. Sure. Yeah. And it just, yeah, it just flowed. It was great. Thank um, you. So first of all, the prom thing just was amazing. I just was like, in my head, I was like, prom, prom, prom. It was amazing. Right. There was a lot more, obviously, than that. But I just was. Who doesn't love prom? Do you remember your prom? Absolutely. I went to a fucking all girls school. So, yay. (laughs) I mean, obviously, we still have prom. Right. Um, Do you look upon your prom fondly? 
Um, sure. I don't look at it unfondly. Okay. Don't I think mean, that's a word either, but. Right. I know that's either why way. I emphasized it. Okay. I look at that time period around prom and what all that meant. And it was phenomenal because that was the biggest thing to date that had happened in my life. Right. To date? At that point oh, in oh. time. <laughs> I thought you meant up, to, up till now. It's I was never, like, Let's never talk gotten about better than prom. <laughs> prom was it. Yep. Okay. Good to know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, okay. So moving on. The whole homeless guy thing mm -hmm. was amazing. Like oh, great imagery, wasn't oh it? Oh my God. And but yeah. then when you brought it back at the towards the end, saying that the version that was the version of him that had nothing, and then right. it was the homeless guy, and he was like, Holy shit. Mind blown. Total mind blown. Yeah. I thought that was phenomenal. That's when I was thinking, like, what? How did Doug do that? Well, part of that, I was thinking of, you know, the the Joseph Campbell line, which I say it every time and you can dispute it, but I'm going to be right. I'm not well read, but it's the, the, the Joseph Campbell line about following your bliss, mm -hmm. right? Which if you follow your bliss, you put yourself on a kind of track that has been there all the while waiting for you. All the life that you ought to be living is the one you are living. Wherever you are, if you're following your bliss, you're enjoying that refreshment, that life within you all the time. And no, Powerful. I did not just spout that from memory. That was on my phone. So I got to look at that. He's lying. No, I'm not. I know. Fuck you. I can't remember that <laughs> shit. But I mean, I paraphrase that and go following, like, I think people have heard that term, follow your bliss. Right. And the Joseph Campbell thing, the hero's journey, a, a big piece of, of the bliss is it's here right now. Right. We just have to awaken to it. It's It's been here all along. And that's sort of, you know, what I was trying to highlight just in that moment. Right. Yeah. I mean, it was very powerful. You could hear him say it. I mean, he was just like, what? Yeah. There was a, a level that brings prom and maybe even the the homeless guy or that mentality together. Do you think that that represents mom and that idea that, you know, from prom, uh, Drew's girl in real life or no, in the dream, in the first dream, choosing to go to prom with somebody else was mom choosing to end her life or to do drugs over him. Wow. Right? Yeah, that was pretty deep. And kind of seeing it that way, like, oh, yeah, that theme came up too. I didn't even think about that because, again, I'm not a dream analyzer. Right. Interpreter, maybe. Well, what you did compare it to. Bring it. Was you're saying, so not dream analysis, but it's like, how do we make sense of it? Like horoscopes. And yes. I was like, yeah. <laughs> Uh-oh. Freaking love horoscopes. Yep. Only when they apply to me accurately. Well, and who applies them to you accurately? Myself. That's right. And when they're not applicable, I'm like... Pfft, discarded. Discard. Total yeah. discard. Oh, so you guys talked about how he didn't say anything to his girlfriend because he didn't know what to say. Mm -hmm. And then he said something, the one sentence, oh my God, I had the craziest dream. Right. And you said, yeah, that would work. That's perfect. Right. That is great. Right. Then he tied that into last week about how, basically how you guys had talked about how to simplify the conversation. Right. Which I thought was amazing. He was kind of like, oh yeah. Yeah. It was, it was such a cool moment for me as a therapist too, because I'm hearing him say, I don't know how to do this. And he says it to me. And when we're not overthinking it and we just kind of say it, sometimes that's the most honest and vulnerable we can be. Right. And it was beautiful for, again, for me as a therapist in that moment to hear it from him, show it to him that he just did it right. and just said it and also apply it to something else, not just this one situation. Right. So he wasn't shooting all over himself by totally. saying, oh, I should have said that to her. You're right. Right. It's going, oh, right. That did kind of come out of me. That did kind of flow out. I can do this. Right. right? Yeah. No, it was great. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. I got a little confused. Mm -hmm. So the photo shoot thing. Oh, yeah. So the model photo shoot thing, first right. of all, was funny. Um, <laughs> then he said, so one of their friends did a group chat, right? Text, whatever. Yeah, I can I can clarify a little bit. You can tell me what confused you, but I'll clarify a little bit because we did have to cut a few things okay. that were identified. Well, it just, he, it's, I thought it sounded like he got mad, mm -hmm. but his girlfriend didn't say it. Was it because she agreed with it? No, no, I think. Girlfriend wasn't really involved in that particular aspect of it, but okay. because it was girlfriend's phone, girlfriend's friend. I mean, actually it was his phone, but yeah. a group text from girlfriend's friend. Right. Why did they get in a fight about it then? 
it was more just the sort of the the environment and culture that he was in. Okay. You know, and first it was feeling uncomfortable at this photo shoot. Right. He was like, I'm not a model. I'm okay. here with all these yeah, models because yeah. they're working, but I'm doing this because it's for a website and I need to do this. Okay. And they're kind of like, it's clear. They're not making fun of me, but it's clear I don't belong. And then you see this group text where he gets, you know, called out for something yeah. completely different. Right. But in that same climate for him, it, it was just a, a zing. And even though you didn't hear girlfriend join in on that, mm -hmm. she also didn't protect him from I any see. of that and okay. didn't move towards him. Got it. So he felt Got isolated, it. abandoned, rejected. Okay. Right. Okay. So there was a lot of, and I, I wasn't waiting for you to say it, but mm. I was, when you did say it, I was like, oh, there you go. Mm. So many cognitive distortions. Oh yeah. Later when you guys were talking about the wedding. Right. 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 So first, the first thing I noticed about the wedding thing was when he said, oh, and bringing my girlfriend to the wedding. And then what if she, and I was like, what? You're bringing her to the wedding? Right. Like just threw that out there all of a sudden. Right. I was right. tripping. I was like, um, okay. So that's <laughs> the first we're hearing about that. Right. Because I was thinking, well, it's a big enough deal as is. Are right. you sure about that? Right. Well, and that's you, not just personal, but how our brains work. You're picking up on that. So you can tell that, oh, that makes sense because a lot of his discomfort yep. about it isn't just being present at the wedding yep. or not knowing a lot of people. It's, totally. I'm bringing my girlfriend. It's the first time they're going to meet her. It's, yep. uh, how's this going to go? I don't know. And yeah. I thought him saying, what if she doesn't like my family or I'm not good enough? I thought, what? Fuck her. <laughs> like, that's your concern? Like, I was thinking, what if your family doesn't like her, you know? Oh, yeah. That was my thought. Sure. And But, of course, like, this is his thing is, like, what if I'm not good enough? That's his right. sort of the theme. Right. And what's a little more known for him is he probably knows how family might react to people, mm -hmm. especially if he's bringing somebody home. They might already sort of by default be at a place of wanting to welcome and wanting to appreciate who Drew's bringing around. Right. You know, but the unknown is what she's going to think. And there's, there's a lot of that. That's even the, the group text that we were talking about a second ago, she didn't come in and say anything. She didn't stand up for him. Right. So he notices the absence of certain things right. in the relationship. Right. right. Yeah. And just the, so again, his cognitive distortions, his, mm -hmm. so there was fortune telling, catastrophizing. Yep. And one of the things that you said was, which I loved was the bachelor mm. party can be part of the journey, not the destination. Right. I think is what you said. Totally. And that it can be meeting people to get to know everyone, which didn't even occur to me. Right. Right. And then the best part was he was like, mm, nah, I don't know. I just still don't want to go <laughs> or something like that. <laughs> right. Which is like, totally fine. Yeah. And highlighting like, here's, let's look at more angles of it. So right. we can take out some of the distortions that aren't true and we can look at more things and, and give ourselves self a, a true sense of choice, not obligation. Right. Right. And looking at it like that way was, it was kind of cool. Yeah. And I didn't think of it the first time we talked about it either. I literally wrote it down. I was like, why didn't you talk about it that way before? That's what I wrote. Yeah, absolutely. It, it honestly did not occur to me yeah. at all. And I think, in fact, it was my sister who listened to that episode and she and I were talking, which is why I should probably read more viewer mail, right? Probably. Um, and she kind of said, oh, I was thinking like the bachelor party might be a good like stepping stone for the wedding, like a way to, you know, break the ice and like, oh. Juliana, you're a genius. She should be a fucking therapist you, too. Well, clearly. Right? We all know that. <laughs> and then he said, well, what if it goes badly? Then the wedding's fucked. And I was thinking, Whoa. Do, you, do you just want, like, you want to go straight to the fucked wedding then? Right. Do you know what I mean? Like, and, right. and which I get it. Yeah. Very possibly. Right. Because why ruin the wedding? Like, if you just go to the wedding and it's awkward, at least it's not fucked. You <laughs> right, know what I mean? Right. Yeah. And I, I don't think at this point with him, I had talked about the the sort of 10 classic cognitive distortions. Mm. And that's something that, you know, it, it's interesting because that's, I have a handout in my office and that's usually the only thing I'll hand out. I like the copy that I have because it's got pictures of things. Oh, you gave it to me and right? I started giving it to my clients as opposed to the one I normally use because obviously right. CBT is such a big part of DBT. Right. And it's so much better because it has the pretty pictures. Yep. Yep. And it, it's, again, not stopping 
those things from happening. It's just building that awareness that that's what's going on. Right. So we can then go, wait, well, hey, hang on a second. That's not right. 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 We're go- we'll put those on the website. Absolutely. Was you going to say that? <laughs> I was going to say the same thing. Oh, my God. I just saw your eyes light up like, ooh, we can use the website for that. Totally. Awesome. Links to everything. Yes. So th- you also said at some point, I'm not a positive thinker. I'm an accurate thinker. Yep. And I was like, Ugh, what does that mean? Oh, that's one of my favorite lines. And then I thought maybe in a, we talk a lot in DBT about feelings versus facts. Mm-hmm. And I thought maybe that's similar. Yeah. Potentially. Really when I, when I bring that line out, which I use a lot, it's usually when I'm talking about CBT things, when I'm talking about balance and even along the lines of, of Yoda and Vader, it's not replacing one with the other. It's trying to find middle way. And I always flash on an old Saturday Night Live bit. <laughs> of course you do. <laughs> of course, because I got to have a story for this. Okay, tell um, me. Do you remember Stuart Smalley? Of course. Right? In the sweater, looking at himself in the mirror, and he goes, because <laughs> you're good enough, you're smart enough, and doggone it, people like you. Yep. Like To me, that's the cliche of a positive thinker. And that's uh. that's not what I mean when I'm trying to like... When I say I'm not a positive thinker, I'm not just, oh, just look on the bright side. Right. Just be positive about right, things. Right, right, right. Like, how can we turn this around? That's not <laughs> my thing. And Yeah, no, it's not mine either, obviously. Right. But I, I look at, well, most things that happen in life are neutral. Mm-hmm. Most, not all, but okay. most are neutral. How so? Well, there's a story that the gist is like farmer has, you know, all his horses run away and somebody goes, oh, what bad luck. He goes, bad luck, good luck, who knows? The horses come back with, you know, twice as many in number because they brought in a bunch of wild horses. Like, wow, you've got so many more horses. What good luck? Oh. Good luck, bad luck. Who knows? Because his son is trying to tame one of the wild horses, throws him, breaks his arm. And, <gasps> but then he, the draft comes for the army, but he can't go because he broke his arm. So it's all oh, good luck, bad luck. We, right. we can never really say. Right, right. It's just stuff that happens. We place the value judgment on it for how we think of something at a specific point in time. Right. Right. So what's interesting about that is what you were doing with with Drew earlier was what I would think of as, I don't know, positive thinking, but you were checking the facts with him. You were challenging him on the cognitive mm-hmm. distortions of, yep. well, it's going to go shitty. And you're like, but, well, what if it doesn't? Right. So right. whether that's accurate or just what if. Right. And we're, we're, we're challenging those core beliefs. We're challenging what their perception of reality or what their known reality is at the time. Right. Because their reality might be based on a distortion, you know, an error line of code. Right. Right. That we have to clear up. So if we do that, it'll make more sense. And to me, that's, that's the heart of thinking accurately. Right. 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 So yeah, it it came up quite a bit in this and to be able to kind of plug those in and see that and just plant those seeds. Right. I mean, it'll be interesting to see how he starts thinking differently about this. Right. Because- all these seeds that we throw in and you guys will notice if you haven't already, I'm crazy repetitive in sessions. You know, maybe that's partly why I use all these analogies and stories <laughs> so I could say the same damn thing over and over again in different ways. But right? it works. It works if you work it. <laughs> oh, no, you didn't. <laughs> no, you didn't. <laughs> okay. He said every time he opens up, they always leave. Yep. And I was like, yep. what are you talking about? Like legitimately wanting to know. Right. And I was wondering every time he opens up about what, first of all, Mm. is he just talking about his night terrors? Oh, good Is he just talking about, is he talking about his life? I have no idea. Yeah. And then they, is he just referring to past girlfriends? Is he referring to his family? What was he referring to? Sure. Yeah. And the truth is, I don't know. And I love, I love your take on that because that idea of who they are, like, I know enough of they, I don't know specifics right. and we can get into that for sure. But that idea, you know, right before that of, he often talks about vulnerability. Like he'll say the word vulnerability, right. you know, he doesn't even have to watch that Brene Brown video. Like he's got it, you know, <laughs> which if you haven't seen it, go see it. Um, for sure. Yeah. I wonder what that means, mm-hmm. like you said, and and I don't know. And that's something that I definitely do want to bring up because it's, all right, what does vulnerability mean to you? Right. You know, and there's sometimes a fine line between that vulnerability and that neediness or codependence. Mm-hmm. And, you know, when I open up, when I say I need you and then you're not there. Right. Right. Do you really need them? 
in right. the moment. Sometimes you do, sometimes you don't. It's right. what we talked about a few sessions ago about reassurance. Right, exactly. Right? And then, because then he talked about his girlfriend, like, fixing it. And right. again, right. again, I was thinking, fixing what? Is it just the night terrors that he's talking about? Or fixing yeah. him? Fixing what? Yeah, and this is almost like another inception type thing. Right. Like the dream within the dream, the right. fix within the, the thing. Yeah. Because it was not necessarily about... It was him thinking she wanted to fix him. We right. don't know what she's thinking. And he's not broken. Like what, a lot of times my clients will say they need to be fixed. And I was like, you're not a broken vase, you right. know, like right. we want to work on things. You're struggling with things, but you're not broken. And a right. lot of people right. feel broken. And if that's how they want to look at it, that's fine. And sometimes whether you're broken or not, you just want to be comforted. Right. You just want to know you're not alone or exactly. that somebody's there and, and. It's not about the fix. It's right. not like gluing that vase back together. It's, you know, just going, yeah, that vase broke. That's a bummer. Oh, wait, if the person's the vase, that would suck. But Are you going to use that analogy? Uh, if I think about it long enough, I could okay. find a way to use it. Okay. I'll steal something else of yours and okay. use that Great. and give you no credit. Thank you. That's right. Okay. I think that idea, though, of just being present for it, and he even says that, you know, like even in when I reflected back to him, yeah. when he said, I didn't even know what to say. You just said it. Yeah, right? exactly. And just being there for it is what I need and what I want. That's, the, I mean, the quote unquote right. fix. Right. It's not take the night terror away. It's ah, let's be here in this mindful moment totally. presently now. Yep. Right? Yep. Yeah, I like it. Okay. Coming up, we will actually, in the next episode, look a little bit more at relationship stuff Ooh. and some anxiety triggers that come up. Yeah. Um, what's cool that you and I started talking about it, and I guess- that was what let me led me to do this with him is I think I did pull out the CBT <gasps> sheet with him, but we, we'd talk at least a little bit about the the CBT loop and, and you know, ski trails in our head and, and how that gets formulated. And, ski trails in our head. Yeah. Nice. Listen, like, don't like, rate us, subscribe to us, go to yourmentalbreakdown.com. Look and, for uh, our cognitive distortion handout <laughs> that's on right. our website. Cool. Okay. Bye, everybody. Bye.